Well, I want to begin in what will seem like kind of a strange place today. If you've checked the sermon schedule on the back of the little bulletin, uh, you know we're supposed to talk about Jesus and money today. <clears throat> but I don't want to talk about money as we start. I want to talk about space exploration. Some of you are thinking, well, good, I don't want to talk about money either. Did you see the, the story last week about the rocket that blasted off from Mercury? Did you see that? Anybody? Okay. There's a joint European-Japanese space mission called Beppe Colombo. If you're interested, it's named after a, an Italian physicist named Giuseppe Colombo. And it blasted off from French Guiana last Friday <clears throat> on a seven-year journey to Mercury. Seven years. Now, I'm not a rocket scientist, but for some reason I read this little news article. and Some, some stuff caught my attention. First of all... It's uh, the, the rocket they blasted off called the Ariane 5 rocket. It's one of the world's most powerful rockets ever. Uh, during liftoff, it burned through five tons of fuel every second. Think about that. That's 10,000 pounds of rocket fuel a second during liftoff. I thought I got bad gas mileage. Now, it only takes about five months to get from Earth to Mercury, but it's going to take seven years for this spaceship to get into orbit around Mercury because the spacecraft has to fight the gravitational pull of the sun. And that's because, and I did not know this, but the sun's gravity is 28 times stronger than Earth's gravity. I know you're interested in that, but let's put it in perspective. I weigh about 185 pounds here on Earth. On the moon, where the gravity is one-sixth what it is here, I would only weigh about 30 pounds. That would be fun. On the sun, I would weigh about 5,000 pounds. Ouch. The result of the sun, that is that the sun's gravity is so powerful that if this spacecraft doesn't take drastic measures to slow down, uh, it'll be pulled straight into the surface of the sun and be burned to a crisp at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So the plan is to slow the spaceship down by using specially designed ion plasma engines, whatever that is, and doing something like nine flybys of other planets, however you do that, just to slow it down. And even so, the ship will be traveling at a rate of 37 miles a second. Just wrap your head around that. 37, that's 133,000 miles an hour. So, why start with the gravitational attraction of the sun? Well, I think one of the best ways to understand the role that money or wealth plays in our lives is gravity, gravitational attraction. Because money exerts a kind of pull on everything it comes close to in our culture. Everything, it sucks everything into its orbit and pulls our hearts and our lives all out of shape if we're not careful. We're in a series now called Wrestling with Jesus. Last week we wrestled with Jesus about politics. Today we're wrestling with him about money. And you probably already know that Jesus talks about money a lot in the New Testament. In fact, 11 of his 39 parables have something to do with money. Someone figured out that about 28% of everything he said in the New Testament involves money in one way or the other. He talked about earning money, saving money, giving money, losing money, and serving money. But money makes us a bit uncomfortable. And it makes us uncomfortable because it has a pull on us. It has a kind of gravitational attraction on us. It pulls on us constantly and sometimes in ways we'd really rather not talk about. But today we're not going to ignore it. It's like the elephant in the room. We're not going to ignore it. We're going to wrestle with it. Now a little background before we read the story for today. Uh, the story we're going to pick up in Luke's gospel it happens right at the height of Jesus' ministry. Sort of right in the middle. Uh, Hugh, Luke tells us that huge crowds are gathering to follow him and to listen to what he's going to say or watch what he's going to do. In fact, he says several thousand people are gathered here. So many people that Luke says they're almost trampling one another. So that's the setting. Large crowd. Jesus has the disciples. He's going back and forth teaching disciples, talking to the crowd. And we read this story in Luke chapter 12. I'm going to begin in verse 13. And I'm, I'm going to stop a couple times along the way to clarify. Luke writes, someone in the crowd, this big crowd, said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now I'm going to pause here. Um, a guy in the crowd interrupts him. Now this is not to test him or to trap him like we've seen before. This is just a guy. 
It's not a Pharisee. It's not a religious leader. It's not anyone in authority. It's just a guy who wants Jesus to solve a family inheritance issue for him. Now, most likely the issue here has to do with an ancient Jewish custom of the birthright, which which would require that the oldest brother receive a double portion of the inheritance. So this is probably a younger brother who's saying, that's not fair. I want to get my fair share, and he's asking Jesus to fix the issue for him. It wasn't uncommon to ask a rabbi to intervene in situations like this. But what Jesus says next is surprising. Verse 14, Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Now the word translated greed here is a Greek word pleonexia, uh, which means the desire for more, the lust for material things. Other translations use the word covetousness right here. He says, beware of all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now you need to know also that there were two words possible to use for life here. One was the word bio, from which we get our word uh, biology. It meant uh, biological life, physical life. But that's not the word he uses here. The word is zoe, and it refers to more the quality of life, a rich life, a full life, a life that satisfies. So Jesus is suggesting here to be careful because greed or covetousness might give you more stuff, but that stuff will not give you life, zoe. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. It's a familiar parable. And the first thing we see here is Jesus is issuing a warning about a danger that lies ahead. A danger. So we're going to begin with the danger. Uh, Wednesday, as we all know, is Halloween. And while our boys have grown far too old to go out trick-or-treating, I still miss walking around our neighborhood with little boys dressed up like pirates or sumo wrestlers or um, clowns or filling up their plastic pumpkins and pillowcases. This is a shot from around 2002 or so. Uh, By the way, is it just me, or is Halloween becoming a bigger and bigger deal than it ever used to be? I mean, lights and people's houses, yikes. Um, And I know some people have some misgivings about the whole Halloween thing, and I know it started centuries ago as a pagan festival, but as I understand it, in the Middle Ages, around the 8th century, the church sort of co-opted the pagan holiday and attached it to All Saints Day, So it was All Hallows' Eve, the night before All Saints' Day, and All Saints' Day was a day dedicated to converting pagans. And today, in our culture, it's become kind of a a, a community celebration of fall and a children's event. And so here's my um, encouragement. It's actually a great time to meet neighbors, and that's maybe the best thing about it. Uh, It's a great time to meet neighbors. Uh, Just be a good neighbor. You don't have to get nutty about it. You don't have to turn your yard into like a horror movie or anything like that. But don't 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 be that house that just turns off your light and acts like you're not home. You know what I'm talking about? Don't be that house. Turn on your light. It's safer that way. And get a big bowl of candy. Not the little tiny things. Get a get real candy. Open your door, greet all the kids, wave to the parents, be the house that all the kids want to go to. That's just my little bit of encouragement there. But I remember one Halloween, we got back to the house and the boys did what they always did. They'd get on the family room floor and they'd dump out their, their, their buckets or whatever into piles. And they would, they would count their candy. And this one time, it turned into sort of a, a candy competition. And they, they counted every single little piece. And of course, you know what happened? It, that it gave birth to some serious candy covetousness. <laughs> He's got more candy than I do. It's not fair. Now, keep in mind, every pile they had had more candy than they or I could eat in like two months. But still, they wanted just a little more because they were comparing. It gave birth to a form of greed, covetousness. I want more. 
But it's not just Halloween candy that does that, is it? Right about that same era in our lives, uh, Chapel Street was FBCG. We had one campus. We were much smaller than we are today. And I would go to all these pastor's conferences. And I remember right about that same time being at one where there's just, I was in a group like with these other pastors and had these, these big like giant churches and they had screens and they had cafes and they had fog machines. I'm like, I want a fog machine. <laughs> I really didn't. I thought it was goofy, but the pull was, I want more, I want more. See, money is like gravity. It, it pulls things into its orbit. Now, like gravity, money is necessary and helpful. We all know that. We need it to live. We need it to, uh, to buy food for our families, clothes, our homes. It's how the world works. But it can be dangerous for two reasons. First, we can easily attach our value, our significance, our security to it, and money can become a source of identity in our culture. Secondly, it pulls at us. It can pull our hearts out of shape, and it pulls us toward Greed and covetousness. Back to the story, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now, at first, this sounds like a pretty reasonable request, right? It's not fair. My brother's getting twice as much as me. It should be fair. And so part of us thinks, well, Jesus will just solve the problem for him. He's Jesus. He can do that. Jesus says, verse 14, Man who appointed me judge or an arbiter between you. Then he said to them, Unclear if he's talking to the crowd or to his disciples now. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Now, at first, when you read that, it sounds a little harsh, and it kind of is. Kind of an un-Jesus-like thing to say. He says, I'm not going to sort out your family issues. I'm not. Not going to get involved. But I will warn you about greed, he says. Now, why? Did you see the story just this week of the single lottery winner in South Carolina? The second largest lottery in American history, $1.5 billion, with a B, dollars, a single winner in South Carolina. Did you see that? That person to date has chosen to stay anonymous. You know why? Gravity. Imagine the pull that that much money will create in that family, in that extended family, in that community if they knew it would change every relationship. It would pull everything out of shape. In fact, it would be very dangerous. Gravity. Jesus recognizes that the promise of wealth, this inheritance, has already bent this man's heart all out of shape. Likely has already bent his family out of, out of shape. The world is full of stories about family conflicts over inheritance, right? Jesus is saying greed is dangerous because it's, it's sneaky. It works in the dark where we can't see it. Pastor Tim Keller says greed hides itself from the victim. That's why Jesus says watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. In other words, the danger is covetousness, the desire for more, lurks in your heart and life even when you're not aware of it. After all, no one thinks of themselves as greedy. Isn't that right? It's so easy to find somebody else who's got more, a bigger house, bigger pile of Halloween candy, and we point to them, oh, that must be a greedy person. Not me. We can discount our own desires because somebody else always has more. So if right now, as I begin this message, you're thinking, well, this probably doesn't apply to me. Be careful. Jesus would say, watch out. It lurks in the darkness, has a way of deceiving, convincing us that if we have just a little bit more, more money, bigger house, nicer car, then we'll be happier, more secure, more fulfilled. And what's really happening all the way along is that the gravitational attraction of money and wealth is pulling us out of shape. It's pulling us toward covetousness and actually robbing us of what we most want, and that is life, zoe, satisfaction. And that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says you cannot serve both God and money. And he says that because like gravity, money has power. It's got the power to seduce our affections, even to seduce our worship. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the Apostle Paul writes, Those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a trap 
and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Here's the danger, Jesus says. The danger is not whether or not you get your fair share of the inheritance. It's not whether or not you get as much Halloween candy as your brother. It's the desire for more. And what the desire is doing to your soul. So that's the first thing. The danger. The second thing we see in the story is what I'm calling the myth. The myth. Any of you watch a show that's on TV called um, Storage Wars? Anybody seen that little show? I know it's on. I've never watched the whole episode, but I, I read about it. Storage Wars. Um, it's people who bid for storage uh, units that have gone into default because people haven't made their payments. And they bid on these, and they get whatever's inside. It's like uh, what's behind door number three kind of a thing. Um, and I'm, you may remember this from a sermon I did in the summer, but today in America, self-storage is a $38 billion industry in our country. There are now 50,000 self-storage units in America. And they are being built at the rate of $4 billion of new construction every year. That's just to store the stuff that doesn't fit in our houses, in our attics, or our basements. So in a sense, we are building bigger barns, more and more barns, just to store our stuff. Verse 16, and he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, it's interesting, the man's talking to himself. Soul, you have uh, ample goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry. Now, before I go any further, I want to be clear. The issue Jesus is confronting here is not that the man had a great cop, crop. It's not that the man was wealthy. It's not even that the man built a bigger barn. The issue is why he built a bigger barn. Notice, Jesus begins the story by saying the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And then what's the first thing we read next in the story? What's the first thing the man says to himself? He says, I have nowhere to store my crops. Do you see it? It's a subtle shift, and we can almost miss it. What produced the crop? The land. Okay, that's God. Every farmer knows that the farmer can plant, the farmer can water, but the farmer can't make anything grow. Only God makes things grow by how he created the soil. The land caused the growth, but who takes the credit? The man. This is the first sign that his heart has been bent, pulled out of shape. Notice all the I statements he says. He says, I have nowhere to store my crops. I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul. He's having a conversation with himself. Now notice what's missing. First, and most obviously, God's missing. God's not in the picture. God is not consulted. God has nothing to contribute to the conversation because the man's talking to himself. Secondly, and this is a little bit more hidden, the man is alone. Okay, the man's alone. Not only is he not consulting God, he's not consulting anybody else either. Now, this is, you need to see this is foreign to ancient Jewish culture. I was reading a commentary this week, and ancient Jewish culture was all about community. You lived your whole life with your family, extended family, and your neighbors in the same little town, same little village. It was all about community. So if you had a bumper crop, you would have, they would have all celebrated with you. You would have all talked about what to do with it. But not this guy. He's not interested in what anybody else might think about his bumper crop. Now again, Jesus is not saying that it's a bad thing to have a bumper crop. He's not saying it's wrong for your business to prosper. He's not saying it's wrong to get a, a, a nice bonus at the end of the year. He's not saying it's bad that your investments increase in value. That's not what he's getting at. In fact, the world needs productive farmers and successful businesses. But what he's warning about is the gravitational attraction of money and wealth. He's warning about the myth of bigger barns. That the myth of bigger barns promises what it cannot deliver. It cannot give you life, zoe, and it cannot save your soul. So we have the danger, we have the myth, 
And then thirdly, Jesus talks to us about true wealth. Uh, years ago, well, while I was still in college, so many years ago, um, I was home one summer, and a man in my um, dad's church asked me to have lunch with him. Uh, he happened to be an alumnus from the same school I was going to, and he just wanted to catch up on his alma mater, and so we had this lunch. And he was a, an attorney, and had, had a, all I knew about him is he had had a successful career, and uh, so we had this lunch. And over the course of lunch, he told me uh, sort of about the trajectory of his life. And I won't go into all of it here, but uh, he spent years building a very, very successful legal practice. Uh, on the way, however, as he climbed that ladder, uh, his marriage suffered greatly and his family suffered greatly for all sorts of different reasons. Not all on him, but some uh, on him because he was gone a lot. Eventually his marriage had crumbled, led to a divorce. He was uh, estranged from at least a couple of his kids. And then he said this to me, and I've, I've remembered this line and how he said it in his face for 40 years now. What he said was, Brian, I just lived at a higher and higher level of poverty, he said. I lived at a higher and higher level of poverty. Verse 20, but God said to him, you fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, verse 20 is shocking language. Out of the mouth of God Almighty comes this phrase, you fool. Shocking language. The word used there in Greek is aphron, which means mindless, without reason. Not unlike Lucy hollering at Charlie Brown, you blockhead. Even worse. And he's a fool, not because his land produced a good crop. He's a fool not because he was rich and had wealth. He's a fool not just because he built a bigger barn. He's a fool because he defined his life and his value and his identity by the bigger barn. He's a fool because the day is coming, Jesus says, when he will lose all that wealth one way or another. John Ortberg, who's a pastor in California, says life is like a game of Monopoly. Uh, no matter how many houses and hotels you acquire throughout the course of the game, when the game is over, it all goes back in the box, he says. And I like to add to that first, you go back in the box, and then everything goes back in the box. He's a fool because he hasn't even considered God's role in his sudden wealth. Hasn't even occurred to him. That God was involved in it, and God has an idea what to do with it. And now, God just takes back the life that he had lent this man. And everything goes back in the box. See, the parable, Jesus tells, is not primarily about being rich. He could have told it about a poor man, too, because both rich and poor get pulled out of shape by wealth. Isn't that true? The parable is about being rich toward God. Now what does that mean? In the Sermon on the Mount again, Jesus said in Matthew 6, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, bigger barns, where moth and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me say that last sentence again. We've all heard it, but listen to it again. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's the heart of the parable. So where is your treasure? Tim Keller says, at the center of every human soul, there is something that we treasure. Might be money, might be career, might be family. There's something we treasure right at the center of things. If I could just have this, then I would have it made. Everything would be worth it. I would be worth it. I just had this one thing. And whatever that is, you serve it. It gives you purpose. It gives you identity. It gives you hope. And here's the key. Whatever that is at the center of your soul, your treasure, it either demands your life or it gives you life. It either demands your life 
or it gives your life. Jesus is saying, if what is at the center of your soul is bigger barns. You're a fool because it demands your life. It takes your life from you. If what's at the center of your life, your treasure, is God, he gives you life. Now here Jesus assumes the gospel. New heart, new identity, new destiny, a new purpose. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. A life free from the love of money. A life free from the gravitational attraction of bigger barns. A life rich toward God. So, how do we store up treasure in heaven? How do we know we are rich toward God? In 1 Timothy 6, again, Paul continues. He says, command those who are rich in this present world, that would be us, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, bigger barns, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Same word Jesus used, zoe. So, what does it look like to be rich toward God? The Apostle Paul makes it so clear and so simple. He says, be rich in good deeds, that is, love and serve your neighbor, and be generous and willing to share. Years ago, um, our family was at a, at a parade. I think it was a 4th of July parade. It's a typical small town parade, you know, floats and fire trucks and uh, marching bands and all that. Just a typical small town parade. And as the floats went by, you know, the people on the floats were throwing handfuls of candy uh, toward the children who line the, the curbs on both sides, just throwing candy out, and the kids are racing out there and, and grabbing the candy, putting it in bags and so forth. And I was, our boys were there, and I was sort of egging them on, hey, go get more candy, get candy, get candy. I might have even gone out and got some candy myself, but, you know, you can imagine the scene. It was survival of the fittest and the fastest to get the candy, right? There was always a couple of kids that didn't get there in time to get the candy. And I was watching the scene unfold, and the bigger kids were getting the candy first, their bags were getting full, but there was this one little girl off to the side. She was kind of timid and smaller than the other kids, and she just couldn't get out to, the, to where the candy was in time. She would start out, and she'd be late, and it'd all be gone, and she would trudge back to her mom, and she was getting more and more downhearted as that happened. So I'm just watching the scene unfold, and then I noticed that one of the boys who was doing well candy-wise uh, noticed her. He kind of saw her going back, and he had just grabbed a handful of candy. But instead of putting it in his bag, he followed her back to her mother. And when she turned around, he put it in her bag. And that little girl's face just lit up. And the boy then went back and got some more candy. And he kept, that became his mission. And he, and he slowly, over time, he filled up her bag too. Now, that little boy didn't know anybody was watching. He just did that. But I was watching. And after all these years, I still remember not just the look on the little girl's face, but the look on the boy's face. And I think Jesus would say, see that? See that right there? That's what it looks like to be rich toward God. That's what it looks like to be willing to share. That's what it looks like to be rich in good deeds. That's what it looks like to be rich toward God. As you bow with me as I close today. Lord, I thank you again for your wisdom. We thank you for your words of warning that seem more and more relevant than ever in our culture. Because we're immersed in a world that tells us every day that we don't have enough. A world that tells us every day that we need to have more. That we'll only be happy if we have more. And our hearts and lives get pulled all out of shape. But you want to set us free from the strong pull of wealth, from the myth of bigger barns. So set our, our hearts free by your grace to be truly rich, rich in faith, rich in service, rich in love, and rich in generosity. We pray these things in your name.